Have you ever had a headache where the pain is just unbearable? Or what about you've hurt your knee from maybe playing soccer? What about you've had a fever where it's just spiked up and up and up that you just can't stand it anymore and you need to find a way to drop it? Well, what we tend to reach for when we have these things is the same type of drug. And this drug we call an NSAID, which stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And that's gonna be the topic of today's lecture. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mike, and in this video, we're taking a look at NSAIDs. The first place we need to begin is inflammation. So what is inflammation? Well, inflammation actually occurs anytime you have damage to vascularized tissue. That's really important, damage to vascularized tissue. If there is no blood vessel to that tissue, you're not gonna get inflammation. So think about some types of cartilage have a very poor or absent blood supply, and therefore when that cartilage gets damaged, no inflammation occurs. So inflammation must, by definition, occur only in tissues that when they're damaged, they have a dedicated blood supply. And the reason why is because inflammation is demonstrated by those four cardinal signs, right? Redness, heat, pain, and swelling. And all of that really occurs because of the presence of a blood supply. So let's think about the context of we've damaged some tissue of our body that has a dedicated blood supply. What happens is that these cells, they end up spilling their guts, right? They're damaged. So they spill their guts and release a whole bunch of chemicals. These chemicals are pro-inflammatory chemicals. And the most important pro-inflammatory chemical for our conversation today is prostaglandins. Let's write that up. Prostaglandins. Right, so what do prostaglandins do? Well, really importantly, prostaglandins play a role in promoting inflammation. Let's write it down. How do they do this? Well, the prostaglandins that are released by these cells, what they do is they travel to that dedicated blood supply and they tell that blood vessel to dilate. So if that blood vessel dilates and gets larger, I want you to think about it. If this blood vessel dilates and gets larger, more blood can get to that area. If more blood gets to the area, more white blood cells get to the area, which means they're the immune cells, they can fight off what's going on here. Any bacteria that may have invaded, maybe viruses, or clean up some of the damaged cells. So that's really important for prostaglandins to do this. The other thing that prostaglandins do at the blood vessel is it makes the blood vessel a little bit leaky by putting some holes in it. And that means these white blood cells, these leukocytes that are traveling in, they can leak out and again, clean up that area. So prostaglandins, very important in promoting inflammation. What else do prostaglandins do? Well, they're very good at stimulating nociception. So remember that we have a whole multitude of different receptors in our body. Some are there to pick up chemicals, some are there to pick up temperature and so forth, but there are some receptors that pick up noxious or potentially damaging stimuli. They're called nociceptors. Now the thing is that prostaglandins can trigger or stimulate nociceptors to send a nociceptive signal up to the brain and what's the result here? You experience pain. So, prostaglandins can make us experience pain. What else do prostaglandins do? Well, think fever. So prostaglandins can actually travel to the brain, specifically the hypothalamus, and it can change our thermostat. So remember, our internal body temperature should be about 37 degrees, plus or minus a very small amount. But what can happen is that the prostaglandins can change this. And what it can do is it can crank it up a little bit so that we get to 38 degrees, 39 degrees, 40 degrees, and we still think that we're not hot enough. So we shiver because we think we're cold. This is because in part of prostaglandins. What else do prostaglandins do? Well, they can actually inhibit platelet aggregation. So remember platelets are these little, what look like fragments of cells in our bloodstream and they play an important role in clotting things. So when you have damage to vascularized tissue, platelets come in and help clot that area up. But prostaglandins can inhibit this process. Very interesting. Now this is the thing. 
Prostaglandins don't just do this. This isn't the full list of what prostaglandins do. They actually do a whole bunch of other things. Like what you may ask, let's have a look. Prostaglandins can actually play an important role in maintaining our gastric mucosa. Our gastric mucosa. That is our stomach lining. Remember, our stomach will produce hydrochloric acid. This is important to unravel these complex proteins. Think about it. Proteins are these three-dimensional quaternary structures. They're amino acids that have folded in upon themselves and they play a function. They do things in the body. But if we want to digest them and break them down so we can absorb their individual amino acids, we first need to unravel it. Think about a ball of yarn. Right? If you've got a ball of yarn and you just get some scissors, it's really hard to chop it. But it's a lot easier to unravel that ball of yarn before you chop it. So what hydrochloric acid does is it unravels the ball of yarn. And then the enzymes, proteases, can chop it up. But here's the thing. Our stomach itself is made out of proteins. So what stops the stomach from digesting itself? Well, thankfully, in part due to prostaglandins, we have this mucosal lining of bicarbonate that stops our stomach from digesting itself. Thank you, prostaglandins. Another thing that prostaglandins do is it allows for us to maintain renal perfusion. What does this mean? So perfusion is enough blood going to a tissue to feed it. So renal are the kidneys. Now think about this, the kidneys must get a certain amount of blood to it every single minute. It must filter 120 milliliters of blood every single minute. Why? Because the kidneys are filtering out the unwanted substances in our blood. If this doesn't happen and the kidneys don't work and it doesn't get the right amount of blood, so it's not perfused properly, these metabolites or potentially toxic products can build up in the bloodstream and we get very sick very quickly. So thanks to prostaglandins and the fact that they like to vasodilate, they really like to vasodilate the blood vessels at the kidneys to maintain adequate blood flow for filtration. All right, what else do prostaglandins do? Well, they can actually, interestingly, even though they can inhibit platelet aggregation, they can actually stimulate platelet aggregation. Which is very interesting, right? Because you think, wait a sec, how can the one thing do two opposing things? And the reason why is because there are many different types of prostaglandins. That's important. And as you can see, I've sort of drawn prostaglandins that do this function and prostaglandins that do this function. And so I've broadly characterized prostaglandins into two types. Now I want you to think about this. Here's one of the major differences. The prostaglandins that perform these functions are constitutively activated. What does that mean? It means they're continuously being produced. They're always produced. Housekeeping, right? And the reason why this is happening is because of a very important enzyme that turns them on called COX-1. Now COX-1 stands for cyclooxygenase 1. And it's an enzyme that allows for us to create the prostaglandins that perform these housekeeping functions. What do you think the enzyme is going to be called that performs these functions? It's called COX-2. Wonderful name, huh? COX-2. And this is not constitutively activated. It's induced. It's inducible. So when do you think this one's going to be activated? In times of tissue damage. So when the tissue is damaged, COX-2 kicks into play and turns or transcribes all of these prostaglandins that perform these functions. So now, at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to inhibit this stuff. This is the stuff that makes life unpleasant. Inflammation, pain, fever, and not necessarily this so much that's sort of coming along for the ride. So we want to create a drug that can specifically inhibit the COX-2 and not so much the COX-1. And this is where these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs come into play. There's actually a family of drugs. It's not just one drug. As you know, there's many different types and examples include aspirin, ibuprofen, diclofenac, naproxen, and celecoxib. These are all NSAIDs, right? Why do we have so many? Because we keep trying to create the best non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug to focus on COX-2. So let's first start with aspirin, right? What does aspirin do? Aspirin, when you take it, 
It inhibits both COX-1 and COX-2, and in actual fact, is one of the first NSAIDs that we made, and what does it specifically do? Well, it's more so a COX-1 inhibitor compared to a COX-2. So as you can see, I've drawn this line to demarcate on which side does it more so inhibit, right? Aspirin will inhibit both, but at the recommended doses, dosages, it's more so inhibiting COX-1. Why? What does that mean? Think about it. Somebody takes aspirin, have you ever heard them say, oh, don't take it on an empty stomach, or don't take too much aspirin over time because it may damage your stomach. And that's what it can do because when aspirin is ingested, it can stop the prostaglandins that help produce our gastric mucosa. With that mucosal lining gone, the acid can digest itself and you can get ulcers. Important. If you abuse aspirin and take too much, your kidneys don't get fed as much. You can get acute kidney injury. The other thing, and this is one of the reasons why people take small dose aspirin is because it inhibits platelet aggregation. So remember, these prostaglandins promote platelets to come together and clot, but aspirin will stop that, stop clotting. Why is that important? For people who are at cardiovascular risk, people who are maybe more likely to clot, well, small dose aspirin or baby aspirin can benefit that. Hopefully that makes sense. So we've got aspirin. The next three at recommended dosages, round about equal, equally inhibit COX-2 and COX-1. So first of which include ibuprofen. Second is naproxen. And third is diclofenac. So at recommended dosages, they around about equally inhibit COX-2 and COX-1, which means that if you do take too much of it over time, while they are great at inhibiting inflammation and stopping the painful stimulus from being sent and reducing fever and so forth, they can have these side effects if you have too much. So they can increase your likelihood of getting stomach problems. They can decrease renal perfusion, increase your likelihood of getting acute kidney injury, and they can have a clotting effect or an anti-clotting effect. All right, last one I want to talk about is that of the coccibs. The coccibs, what do you see here with the coccibs? The coccibs are very, very good at being COX-2 specific anti-inflammatory drugs, COX-2 specific inhibitors, which means coccibs are great at stopping inflammation, at stopping pain, stopping fever as well, but the problem in the past has been this, that some of the coccibs have shown because they're COX-2 specific, a lot of these ones, right, these three here, because they inhibit the platelet aggregation and platelet inhibition equally, it sort of negates one another in a way. But the coccibs are inhibiting platelet aggregation inhibition, which means it may make you more likely to clot. And one study many years ago showed that some of the older coccibs increased the likelihood of cardiovascular events. But the current coccibs, like salicoxib, for example, don't necessarily show this, right? But that was one of the issues with the coccibs. But they are great as anti-inflammatory, uh, analgesic as well, antipyretic, right? Means anti-fever. And again, that may be a potential side effect. So, as you can see, this is how NSAIDs work, and these are some of the most common NSAIDs. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you wanna contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, at Dr. Mike Todorovic, at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.